of science is determined, or the validity of scientific approaches should be and is generally determined, is um, amongst groups of scientists where skeptical inquiry is part and parcel to the basic concept of science, mm -hmm. where there are no views that are chiseled in stone, mm -hmm. that are handed down through the ages, that are immutable, that are not subject to change. Mm -hmm. So it is in the scientific community that you find very, very few people speaking up for the creationist ideas. Mm -hmm. On talk shows, you can find lots of them. Well, but the scientific, but the, but the creationism concepts do not meet the tests of science, and they generally fail, and very few people subscribe to the creationist ideas. Well, Dr. Chambers, I see, got his Ph.D. from Miami University in Ohio in physical anthropology, so we, we do have among us a scientist. And if you could, I think, I think we've kind well, I of... Got, uh, if I may, I got, I got a bachelor's science degree from the Massachusetts <laughs> Institute of Technology, so I'm not without some knowledge of science. <laughs> totally. We have two gentlemen with a scientific background here. What is scientific creationism? How does it differ from the creationism that perhaps Mr. Darrow was arguing back in 1924? Or is there any difference whatsoever? Well, yes, there are many differences in particular. Both, for instance, no one accepts, no creationist that I know of, accepts the version of creation that William Jennings Bryan defended, nor does any evolutionist accept the version of evolution that Clarence Darrow was putting forth. That's all ancient history. But you see, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the world's, perhaps the world's uh, eminent uh, philosopher of, of a scientific method, Karl Popper, mm -hmm. has said that evolution, third evolution, by its very nature, because it is not subject to experimentally, to being experimentally falsified, mm -hmm. is, a, is a metaphysical method. It's not a science. And uh, you see, my uh, my position is that evolution and creation stand on basically level ground mm -hmm. academically, mm -hmm. and therefore the issue is one of academic freedom. For instance, um, I point out that evolution is the re is the religious view of many religions. It is uh, not particularly tied to the Christian faith or the Judeo-Christian faith. It goes back to ancient history. The Greeks mm -hmm. had it. The Egyptians were evolutionists. Then the Mesopotamian cultures had evolution as the basic method. And um, despite what uh, Mr. Hooper says, he's simply wrong about that. I could furnish a bibliography of some of the world's leading scientists whose credentials and credibility is second to none in large numbers who are creationists. Mm -hmm. I could give him a bibliography. It would take him years to work through. The idea that just a hand... This is one of the myths that's being presented by the ACLU, that creation scientists... Well, what you really have is you've got, a, you've got Elmer Gantry in sweaty consternation hurling epithets at at uh, Albert Einstein, and that simply is not what is going on. Uh, for instance, um, uh, now I'd be permitted to read a very short thing, which mm -hmm. I think is representative. Mm -hmm. let, sure. me, let me show you, this is a, the kind of thing that's going on now. Mm -hmm. This is a statement, it's very short, by a Dr. Patterson, mm -hmm. Colin Patterson, who's the senior paleontologist and editor of the journal at the British Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. This is a, a copy of a speech he made in November 5, 1981, before the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Mm -hmm. Dr. Collin is representing, these were a gathering of paleontologists. Dr. Collin is probably one of the top five evolutionists in the world published, and he recognizes mm -hmm. such, at least mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. This is what he said. Again, this is not in a church. This mm -hmm. is at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. My title is Evolution and Creationism. I can tell you that that title was laid on me by Don Rosen. I'm speaking on it to gratify this old friend of 700 years. I've never spoken on it before, and I hope I never have to speak on it again. It's true that for the last 18 months or so, I've been kicking around non-evolutionary or even anti-evolutionary ideas. I think always before in my life, when I've got up to speak on the subject, I've been always confident of one thing, that I know more about it than anybody in the room because I've worked on it. Well, this time it isn't true. I'm speaking on two subjects, evolutionism and creationism. I believe it's true to say that I know nothing whatever of either of them. One of the reasons I started taking this anti-evolutionary view or let's call it a non-evolutionary view, was last year I had a sudden realization that for over 20 years I had thought I was working on evolution in some way. One morning I woke up and something had happened in the night. It struck me that I, that I had been working on this stuff for 20 years and there was not one thing I knew about it. That's quite a shock to learn that one can be so misled so long. Either there was something wrong with me or there was something wrong with the evolutionary theory. Naturally, I know there was nothing wrong with me for... So for the last few weeks, I've tried putting a very simple question to various people and groups of people. I'm almost finished. Mm -hmm. The question is this. 
can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Any one thing, any one thing that is true. I tried that question on the geology staff at the Field Museum of Natural History, and the only answer I got was silence. I tried it on the members of the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar at the University of Chicago, a very prestigious body of evolutionists. And all I got there was silence for a long time, and eventually one person said, quote, I do know one thing, it ought not to be taught in high school. Well, that's, uh, that's rather interesting. You might think it's somewhat different. The doctor talks about uh, academic freedom, mm -hmm. and that's really the essence of the issue from the ACLU point of view. Well, the doctor also it makes the point that, you know, it's only, it's only this, this, this Christian, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this, this Christian notion of evolution that is, that is being, not being taught in the schools and, uh, and that that in itself is a form of discrimination, a charge that I think the ACLU would be especially sensitive to. Well, of course, the, the First Amendment, the First Amendment uh, in its opening words provides for the concept of separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it does exclude religious activities from the schools. Uh, he talks about uh, humanism, for example, uh, that evolutionary concepts and scientific concepts are part of the humanist belief, and that's true. Uh, but humanists also believe in good hospital care and in sound education and in strong family ties and in lots of other uh, areas. I mean, just because the, the humanists happen to embrace evolutionary concepts doesn't mean that, th that they are a core religious belief that should be excluded from teaching. Mm -hmm. On the academic freedom issue, uh, in public schools, students are there involuntarily. They are there because the law requires them to be there. They have a right, under academic freedom <coughs> concepts, to be taught what represents the best knowledge in a given field. In science, what represents the best ideas about science, about the way our world started and the species got here and were developed and whatever. And teachers have a right to teach what they think to be the best ideas. And they would not have that if the Florida legislature mandated the teaching of creationism. I'd like to ask Mr. Hooper a question on sure, this point. Sure, go right ahead. And according to your principles, if one of these many hundreds of scientific creationists, who are, who's a biology teacher, for instance, and there are many of them, if he, in his evaluation, his expertise, he sees creation science as the best explanation of origins, should he be free to teach that in the uh, classroom? Well, that's in a in a public school. Uh, that would be a policy of what what he would teach would be a policy that would uh, tie in with the uh, applicable textbooks that were used and and other policies within the school. He hadn't answered my question. Would it be would he would he be in your principles? Lee, would it be constitutional for him to teach that? Uh, I don't. I I don't think that single issue uh, requires a yes or no answer. There, well, there's there's a lot of factors. Exactly you, what you it don't, requires. You don't just in a in a class on any subject. You just don't take off teaching in a particular direction that that you uh, subscribe to. Unless it's evolution, then you can, right? No, I don't think you can. Uh, you're not going to teach. You can't teach evolution in Jerry Falwell's Liberty Baptist College. Uh, because he's made it very clear, and it's part of the public record that, that well, we're any, not anybody about teaching schools. evolution up there had better uh, teach that schools. the Bible, Bible science is right. But the public schools, if, a, if you have a, a, a biology teacher who's a creationist, should he have the freedom to teach that if he considers that to be the best science, as hundreds of them do? Not, not, not a freestanding of his own accord, no. Okay, I think the, the viewers not now know who stands for academic freedom and who doesn't. You see? Well, I think well, it's time to decide. Oh, you. <laughs> uh, okay, I mean, sorry. you didn't ask me, but I would also no, answer no. Ahead. Because okay. uh, I think that there are parameters of academic freedom. Mm -hmm. A public school teacher is not hired to teach and promulgate religious doctrine. And, and uh, creationism is religious doctrine. No, it no is more out of the laboratory. Mm -hmm. And it and out of the laboratory, uh, it is not dealt with uh, as as science, mm -hmm. but it rightly is dealt with as religious faith, religious dogma. And no biology teacher, chemistry teacher has a right to teach religious doctrine.
-hmm. My point is, there's no more religious doctrine. There's evolution. You see, you're oh, perfectly wait, content because your your th your theory of origins is taught. It's interesting. You see, I mean, I take the position that creation science is just as much science as is evolution. I would point out that when they debate, creation always wins. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education, so the Bible of the education industry, year before last, advised all educators to stop debating creationists. People <coughs> always lose. You see, the point is that that uh, that evolution and creation are both philosophies of biology, and that's all they ever can be. Well, it's, it's forgive just, me if I can... It's just a fact. It's very, very few people in the science field subscribe to Dr. Chambers' ideas. Okay, one there question. are hundreds of thousands of people all over the world that subscribe to evolution. People abroad think it is, it's laughable that there still is a significant movement in this country for the teaching of creationism in our schools. They, they look down their intellectual noses at us and think that we're back in the dark ages of education to even be considering it. What you have said is meaningless for the first place. It's a very medieval approach to gain, to gain the truth by counting heads. And secondly, uh, the, uh, your numbers are wrong. There are more than you admit. And, uh, but the point, and a laugh is not an argument. The point is that there is there is, I think you ought to realize that there are not, we're not talking about one theory, but we're talking about two theories of evolution. One of the things I learned when I got into the higher echelons of the study mm -hmm. is that the version of evolution that comes across in grade school textbooks mm -hmm. is laughed at by the godfathers of evolution. You see stuff in the textbooks, a, a degree of certainty. You see illustrations. You see statements made that men like uh, Meyer and um, Simpson and these men, they laugh at. In mm -hmm. For instance, uh, G. Gator Simpson at Yale, who's perhaps the leading evolutionist in America, he, even, he pokes fun at the, the uh, standard picture of the evolution of the horse. Mm -hmm. he, think, he thinks that's a great joke that it appears in textbooks. He, he's glad it's there because he has nothing to offer in its place. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about one theory of evolution. See, what you have at the textbook level is this nice, neat science. What you have at the upper echelons is a turkey shoot. What you, it, it is, it's interesting. I got uh, last year to show you how this works. Two years ago, I succeeded in getting an anthropology text thrown off the state-approved textbook list. Mm -hmm. and, what, and it was a standard work. There wasn't mm -hmm. anything particularly defective about it according to the standard. And I systematically showed how that each major principle was scientifically unsound, and he threw it off. The interesting thing is I quoted not one single creationist. Mm -hmm. That is, you can find every major tenet of the evolutionary theory, and you can amass, and I've done this, it's right as what Mr. Hooper says, a mass of testimony which thoroughly dismantles it. It, uh, well, that's, it's a tribute to science <coughs> that the scientific concepts change. And I don't think that as the, as the biblical account of creationism, as the creation a model, has that changed since the days of Darwin in oh, any it's respect? Changed, well, it's changed immensely. The, you see, the creation, the oh. Genesis account has changed any no, since the days the of Darwin? No, I'm saying the interpretations of it have changed. It's interesting. We're, also, we're accused... How, how much of the Bible can you interpret? You interpret the Bible is not some standard, standard uh, uninterpretable never-changing uh, uh, thing in your mind? It's not well, there, there are, It's within limits. There's, there's a broad range, and, uh, but uh, we're accused of being absolutists. I've been on both sides of the academic fence. I've been trained by those who believe the Bible. I've been examined and trained by atheists. Let me yeah. tell you that, that, that Christians do not have the, the marker corner on absolutism. If there's anybody who's a bunch of absolutists who absolutely will not change their mind, no matter what the evidence, it's certain evolutionists. So I don't accept the... I don't, I'm not intimidated Mm -hmm. by this charge, well, we in the scientific community, we're willing to change, but you guys aren't. That simply won't fit with history. Interestingly enough, when evolution first was accepted, it was not accepted by the scientific community. It was mm -hmm. laughed at. Mm -hmm. It was accepted by the church. That's intriguing. It was accepted by Herbert Spencer and others who created the social scientists, and Freud, who went back to Lamarck and built his psychology on a faulty theory of evolution. It's interesting, it, and, and evolution is not a, is, it is uh, as much a religious view. Mm -hmm as it is a, as, as creationism is. But doesn't creationism presuppose to divine intervention at some point? But you see, one does not, a, a view does not uh, stop being uh, religious and start being religious at the point of the supernatural. For instance, I believe in, in a supernatural explanation of origins. Mm -hmm. But the evolutionist, the total chance monophyletic organic evolutionist, mm -hmm. he has to hold for a supranatural well, but you see, the problem with the supranatural, that is, he has to uh, propose a biogenesis in the face of the evidence of only biogenesis. He mm -hmm. has to presuppose that 
that de a, a degenerative order of chaos can produce mm -hmm. consciousness and ethics mm -hmm. and, and Dr. art. Dr. Chambers, I would love to have you go on. In fact, I wish we had an hour to sit here and talk. It's been fascinating. I've gotten